Good morning and welcome to FIRST. We invite you to worship along with us through song, prayer, giving, and opening God's Word. Before we get started, I have a few announcements to make. Easter is only a week away and we are looking forward to celebrating the risen King Jesus. Resurrection Sunday is the most critical day in the believer's calendar, but it's also a great service to invite a neighbor, friend, or family member. Grab an invite card at the end of the service on your way out. Before we celebrate Easter, we'll remember Christ's sacrifice through our Monday Thursday service on March 28th at 6.30 p.m. in the sanctuary. This special service of reflection and communion is an important time where we focus in on the final moments leading up to the cross and think deeply about Jesus' willingness to suffer and die for our sin. Getting married is a big milestone. Celebrating 50 plus years of marriage is even bigger. For those of you at the start of your married life or counting down the days until you say, I do, we'd like to invite you to sign up for our free marriage prep course, Prepare and Enrich. Prepare and Enrich is a seven week course starting Sunday, April 7th, and covers critical topics to help you and your spouse prepare for the marriage of a lifetime. Take an easy step toward that 50 year milestone and sign up for our free marriage prep course at marriageprep.net. Join us around the table on Sunday, April 7th for First Family Lunch. Instead of trying to beat the crowd and racing to get that perfect lunch spot, make lunchtime stress free by reserving your seat at the most convenient venue in town. Sit down with friends and family to a five-star buffet meal with a variety of entrees, sides, and desserts. If you're interested in a quality meal without the hassle, then First Family Lunch is the perfect solution for you. Don't wait. Go online to fbccola.com forward slash events and make a reservation today. A couple of weeks ago, our first college ministry took 17 students on a mission trip to Miami with Jen Send. Our college team spent their spring break on mission at Village Church, a small church plant south of Miami with a vision to reach their city for Jesus. Our students helped Village Church with a variety of projects, including a community garden, door-to-door -door canvassing, handing out fresh produce to families, and church site construction. They also did some metro evangelism by taking a ride on the giant monorail surrounding the city. They paired up in twos and threes, sitting with strangers to talk about faith and initiate gospel conversations. Well done, First College, on making an impact for the kingdom. Are you new or visiting with us? We are so glad you are here. Please stop by the Connection Desk in the foyer after the worship service. We have a special gift just for you. Do you have questions about joining our church? Do you want to know more about following Jesus? We would love to help. Counselors will be at the Connection Desk following the service. If you'd like to hear more details about everything I just mentioned and more, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter at fbccola.com. Now, let's worship together.
Thank you so much. Everyone may be seated. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church on this Palm Sunday. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. And we do have a few birthdays that I wanted to announce. Uh, Mary Gunter turns 90 years old on March 28th. And Francis Willis turns 98 on the same day, and they're both worshiping by television. So happy birthday to both of you ladies. <clears throat> and we also have someone selling a, celebrating a birthday in the room today. Miss Betty Gabriel is celebrating 94 years of life today. So happy birthday to you, Miss Betty. She's sitting right there. <laughs> Well, next week is Easter Sunday, so if you are worshiping with us uh, by television or online, we would love for you to join us here in the room as we celebrate our risen Savior. Worship begins at 1030, and it's going to be a glorious day, and I hope you'll be here, and I hope you'll bring somebody with you. Uh, we want to see uh, so many come to know the Lord uh, over the next week, and so that's what we're praying for. Now, um, I, I also want to say to you, if you're here today and you're visiting, we're glad that you're here, and we would love to get to know you. And and connect you with our church. So we have a connect card at the bottom of your bulletin, or you can scan the QR code. But I would also invite you to stop by the connection desk in the foyer where we can give you a gift and help you find your next step here at First Baptist Church. But thank you for being here. And why don't we do this right now? You stand and turn and greet those around you as we continue to worship together. thank you for this day. We thank you that we can worship you, Lord. God, we uh, remember this week as you are headed toward that cross, Lord. But God, this side of history, we know that, Lord, that's not the end. We look forward to that resurrection day, God. Lord, we just thank you that you have died on that cross, that you were resurrected, that we may have life, God. And Lord, we remember that all around the world, in our nation and, and many other nations, Lord, there are so many that are, do not have that knowledge, do not have that salvation. So we pray that you would be with us and let us remember that cross, that we can share the gospel with those who have not heard before. Lord, we thank you and we pray for all you, or thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, and we pray you would just bless our tithes and offerings as we give to you cheerfully, Lord. And God, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
together. Lord Jesus, we're reminded this morning that the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But we thank you that it is our point of redemption. We thank you for that healing stream that flows. And I pray this morning that as we think about the cross of Christ, that we would be ever reminded for who you are and for what you did for us on that cross by paying the penalty for our sins. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Don't let us take it for granted, but our prayer this morning is that you would ever keep us near the cross. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Jesus.
That's right, Jack. Glory. Glory to God. He stumbles down the narrow street bearing the weight of the Roman cross on his back. Now, the wooden beams, they're heavy, but it's those three-inch spikes that he wears as a crown that's causing the blood to flow. His back's been tenderized as a Roman soldier took a whip with leather straps that at the end there were metal pieces and pieces of bone that just landed on his skin. This very public execution outside the city gates of Jerusalem is meant to humiliate him and to deter anybody else who would dare challenge the Roman way of life or cross the Jewish religious elites. Onlookers don't show pity. They hurl insults at him. They spit on him. They shout to him and say, save yourself. And from a distance, those who had called him rabbi watch with bated breath as he exits out of the city gates, down the path, and up towards a hill that resembles a skull. The pain on their faces reveals that his followers' hearts are breaking. Suddenly the man stumbles. The soldiers kick him, tell him to keep going. Get up, carry the cross. He can't do it. He's out of strength. So they jerk a man out of the crowd who's standing by the roadside and says, you do it, you pick it up. And Simon stoops down and he takes the wooden beams, places them on his shoulders and he leads the procession up the hill to Golgotha. When he gets to the top, the soldiers tell him to place the wooden beam down on the ground and then they force the condemned man down upon the wooden beams. They stretch out his arms. A couple of the men hold his arms and hands while one pounds the nails through the flesh of his wrist and into the cross. Then the other hand, and then his feet. His mother screams as the nail breaks the flesh of his wrist. Other women are there to support her, and they weep with her as she watches her son murdered by these Roman guards. Perhaps there were other people there in the crowd that we would have known. We would have known about because of the stories we read in the scriptures. Could it be that The woman with that medical ailment that caused her to bleed for 12 long years was there watching from a distance. The woman who found no healing until she was able to touch the hem of his robe. Could she have been there watching him crucified? She had been living as an outcast, unclean, unable to even enter into the temple until she met this so-called criminal. Perhaps Bartimaeus was there watching as tears rolled down his face, something he would not have been able to do until that faded day when at the city gates where he was begging, Jesus walked by and he says, I want to see. Maybe Nicodemus was there, the secret follower of Jesus who had come to Jesus under the shroud of darkness to ask him, how can a person be born again? Lazarus, the one who had actually tasted of death, could it be that he was there? Watching this condemned man, the one who called his name and caused his decaying body to come up out of the grave and walk out. Now, Lazarus is something of a celebrity. Could he have been there watching Jesus crucified? What about that man who was unable to walk, who had friends that got him to Jesus, that lowered him through the roof of a house down in the midst of a massive crowd who just wanted to get close to this, crim- this criminal, this accused man. They wanted to be, hear his message, to experience his healing. And on that day, that man not just, didn't just, wasn't just able, made, made to walk. He had his sins forgiven. Do you think he would have been there 
watching outside the walls of Jerusalem as Jesus was now raised up on the cross, just like Moses raised that golden bronze serpent up, suspended between earth and sky, attached to the wooden beam above the dying man's body as a sign. In the three languages, it says, King of the Jews. And on either side of the crucified criminal are two other criminals. And one hurled insults. The conversation takes place and something about, today you'll come to paradise. One believed, one did not. And over the course of a few hours, the man who was suspended on the middle cross uses his knees and his back and what strength he has left in his shoulders to force his body up so he can fill his lungs with air. Every breath harder than the one before. His body grows weaker. Many in the crowd are crying. Some have torn their clothes. What a turn of events. I mean, just days earlier, Same people, some of those who have now started hurling insults were there on the road from the Mount of Olives up to Jerusalem. They had been waving palm branches, shouting, you know, hallelujah, hosanna, here he comes, throwing down their cloaks to prepare the way for this man who's now being crucified because he's a criminal, preparing the way so he can enter into the city, ready to see him installed on the throne. But now he's rejected a common criminal, he's shamed, he's rejected, he's beaten. The religious elites and the Roman rulers show no mercy. They revel as he is humiliated. And while the crowds watched, the man slowly faded, sky grows dark, then the man shouts loud enough for most who were there to hear, uh, that most who were there watching this public execution, they can hear him, Matthew 27, verse 46. It says, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These words are actually a quote from a psalm Jesus surely recited as a kid in the synagogue. And the words were familiar to him, but distant, because he didn't know what it was like to be forsaken by God. But here in this moment, in his distress, These words come to his mind from Psalm 22. Today's Palm Sunday, when we remember our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, but the road into Jerusalem ultimately led to Golgotha's hill. And so this morning, I want to preach a message on the cross of Christ from Psalm 22, a message entitled, Why Have You Forsaken Me? And of course, this is a detour from our consumed Bible reading plan as we remember and proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to turn with me to the 22nd Psalm, and I'm going to read to you as we begin, verses 1 through the first part of 21. Psalm 22, verses 1 through 21. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy. Oh, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip, they wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Yet ye are, you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breasts. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. 
it is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we pray that it would lead us all to the cross. May we stumble on the cross and fall on your grace today, Jesus. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 22 is a psalm of lament. It's written by King David during a time of personal intense suffering and isolation. Now, the end of the psalm that we did not read is actually a call for the people to praise God because he did deliver the king from the brink of death. But this psalm finds its fulfillment in Jesus who cried out the words of this psalm from the cross. And it is a call to God's people to praise the Father for delivering Jesus from death and securing our eternal life with him through his personal sacrifice. Now Psalm 22 is first a lament from David. So we're going to begin by looking at Psalm 22 as David's lament. Over the last week, we've been reading uh, through the book of Joshua as part of our consumed Bible reading plan. And we just started the book of Judges yesterday. This week, we'll conclude the book of Judges and the book of Ruth. And then right after Easter, on Monday after Easter, we will start in the book of 1 Samuel, which is the beginning of Act 2, Scene 5 of the story of Scripture which is the era of the kingdom and the kings. And then on the Sunday after Easter, I'm going to return to preaching from the Bible reading plan. And for seven weeks, we're going to deal with the life of King David that's captured in First and Second Samuel, the book of Psalms, First Chronicles. So here we are now in an early psalm of David. And the header of Psalm 22 says that this is a psalm of David's. Now, we don't know what event precipitated David pinning this psalm. We don't know when it was written, but it was, I want to be clear here as we study the psalm that this is first of all a psalm inspired by God, written by David as a poetic response to his own circumstances. So this is his own personal cry for help. And he cries out to God from the midst of his suffering, why have you forsaken me? Now David did experience some pretty low lows in life. He knew what it was like to have to run for his life. He had family and friends turn against him. He knew what it was like to be in a foreign land with nobody to turn to. He had felt the sting of regret and of sorrow. He was acquainted with very severe grief. So here he is on this occasion, whatever it is that he's experiencing, the pain is excruciating because it's a sense of abandonment by God. He not only felt alone in human terms, but also in spiritual terms. You've turned your back on me, God, is what he prays. I call out to you, but you don't answer me, God. I lay awake waiting to hear you. Why have you left me? Have you ever experienced a season of life that felt like silence and abandonment from God? Has life ever dealt blows your way that made you think that he's removed his hand from your life, that he's no longer concerned what it, with what concerns you? Well, David's heart's breaking in this psalm. I call to you, but it seems like my prayers don't even make it out of this room. Are you even listening? What happened to you, God? Please let me know you're there. Have you ever experienced that feeling that David is expressing here in the psalm? Now, the psalm begins, or excuse me, yeah, here the first part of it goes back and forth between words of I and me uh, to words of you or thou. And so here in verse 3, it pivots from I or me to you. He says, yet you are holy. 
David doesn't doubt the character of God, even though the circumstances around him say you ought to walk away from him. God's silent? Well, that must mean he doesn't care about you. So he declares here in the psalm the holiness of God. He points out how the nation of Israel praises God, and God has chosen to enthrone himself upon the praises of his people. He's ushered into the temple by the people's praises. He also praises or proclaims that God has been reliable for generations. Our fathers and grandfathers called out to you. You answered. They were never disappointed because they placed their trust in you. And then in verse 6, he pivots again back to the I and the me. He says in verse 6, but I am a worm. David does not come touting his own credentials. He doesn't claim to have a righteous leg to stand upon. He's singing about the character of God. He's proclaiming God as king over all creation. And he presents himself as a very humble creature, a worm and not a man. That's what he says in the psalm. But this is not just humility. It's also self-pity, right? I'm despised by everybody. Everybody who sees me, they sneer at me. They shake their heads. They turn away from me. They mock me. Oh, you're in need of help? Well, commit yourself to the Lord. He'll save you. Sarcastically, they say, let him who rescue you because, well, you delight in him, right? David feels all alone. He finds himself at the end of his rope. No one there to support him. And then in verse 9, he pivots away from himself and back to God. Yet you, O oh God, you're the one who brought me into this world. I know I am not here by accident. You've got a purpose for my life. And from the very beginning, I've trusted in you. I'm not going to doubt that now. So David trusts in God, but he's surrounded by enemies. Trouble is near, but God is far away. He says that kind of over and over again. That's the theme. I'm right in the middle of a problem, but you're nowhere to be found. David feels abandoned by the Lord, despised by the people around him. And in verse 12, he begins to outline the vicious attacks of his enemies. And it's so brutal that as he looks around and he sees the enemies, he describes them as being like animals. They're like bulls and lions and dogs. These are vicious creatures. Bulls and lions, that would kind of be the epitome of power. They are a formidable opponent. I don't have a chance unless you show up, God. I need you to support me. And David says, I'm poured out like water. He's drained. He's paralyzed with fear. He finds himself at the brink of death. And once again, David pivots from I and me and back towards God. Verse 19, but you, O Lord, he says, be not far off. And this is a repeated verse. We see it in verse 11 too. David's petitioning God in his prayer now. Be not far off. Hasten to my assistance. Hurry up, God. Deliver my soul. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the hands of my enemies. Now, we don't know exactly what David is facing as he pens this verse here. We don't know what he's going through. But we do know that it's a painful and a, uh, a scary experience. But even in the middle of that experience where he feels abandoned by God, despised by him, David trusts in God. So what does he do? He calls out to God. In his distress, his first call is to God. And that's a bit convicting to me. David hits a serious hole in the road. He has this real setback. It's a dramatic situation. His first instinct in that moment, call on God. Why? Because I trust God. I don't trust others. I trust him. I'll call on him. If your trust is in God, then the first call you ought to make ought to be to God as well. Now, I'm quick to say I need to pray about that. Or I'm quick to say, you know, we're all praying. We're asking God to move. You know, we're gonna, we need to ask him to move in this situation. But David actually prayed. He doesn't just write, oh, pray. You know, he pray, he crawl, cries out to God. He calls out to him, my God, my God. And his prayer is very raw. It's very honest. You have forsaken me, God. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He expresses exactly what's on his heart. He doesn't presume upon the Lord. He's not casual with God. He asked of the Lord what was heavy on his heart, what he needed, what he wanted. But I want to be clear here. David is not actually looking for an answer. He's not looking for God to say, well, the reason I forsook you is this. That's not what he's doing. It's a rhetorical question. He doesn't want an answer. He just wants action. 
God, would you do something about it? Help deliver my soul. You know, I think some of the reasons that the people of God talk about prayer rather than pray is because we're not sure God's on the other line. We're not sure he's listening in. Or perhaps he's listening in, but I'm not sure he can actually do something about it. These are just circumstances that just kind of have to play out. Or maybe if he can do something about it, he's probably got bigger concerns than what I'm going through. So I just don't pray. Or some of us, we just look at prayer as if it's a good luck charm, right? Somebody says they need prayer, so we just send prayer hands. We don't really do anything. We don't call out to God on their behalf. Or maybe we say, can you pray for me? But we're just not really serious about actually praying to God. Maybe it's a last resort when I'm desperate. Have you ever felt abandoned by the Lord? Have you ever felt despised by the people around you? It can be very lonely, especially if God's silent. So David cries out and lament, but his lamentation is grounded with his faith intact here. And you see that in the opening line. He cries out, my God, my God. He doesn't reject what he believes to be true, even though he feels distant from the Lord. Well, in times of lamentation, beginning your cry with, my God, reminds us there's a rock that's higher than I, right? There's some, I may be in a pit, but there's solid ground. There's a rock I need to build my life on, and that's what I need in this moment. So my God, so I cry out to him, and it inches me closer to the one that I want to draw close to me. Well, it's hard to locate in David's life, even as you study. I mean, many of the Psalms, you can pick out exactly what David's going through. Um, we're we're going to look at one of those in the coming weeks. We know what's happening in David's life, and we're going to look at what he writes, what he says or sings about that situation. But this one, it's hard to detect because it doesn't match up with the circumstances we know about David's life. I think that's because this Psalm is actually fulfilled. It finds its fulfillment in the suffering not of King David, but of King Jesus. Psalm 22 is foremost Christ's lament. On the most difficult day in Jesus' life, he experiences the uh, the pain that David writes about here in Psalm 22. God has turned his back on him. And so from the cross, Jesus cries, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now this is not just some poetic phrase that's just popped into his mind. I'm fairly certain that Jesus actually had in mind the whole psalm when he says these words from the cross, but he didn't have enough breath. He didn't have enough strength to quote the whole thing. No lung capacity for that kind of thing. But to think, David penned these words a thousand years before I believe they came to be there at Calvary. This psalm is prophetic. It's prophetic about this most difficult day in the life of Jesus, the day of his death. And there are details here, even about crucifixion, that would have been so foreign to David. It's something that had never even been done. Definitely not something that was known about in his day when he writes this psalm and describes what's going to happen to Jesus. So I want us to look together at how this psalm is fulfilled by Christ. In verse 6, the psalmist writes, "Um, I am um, a reproach of men. I'm despised by people is what he says. That's the same idea that Isaiah captures in his prophecy about the suffering servant. Isaiah 53, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows who's acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. That's precisely what Jesus experiences here on the day of his crucifixion. Verse 7 of the psalm says, all who see me sneer. They separate with the lip. And you think, what in the world does that mean? They scowl. They show their teeth at me. They wag their head. I want you to listen to how Matthew describes the crowds there in Jerusalem on the day of Jesus' death. In um, Matthew 27, verse 39, it says, And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. Now, five days earlier, on the first day of the week, the day we commemorate as Palm Sunday uh, here today, crowds were gathered. We've already said this. They were gathered. You know, they were ready to enthrone Jesus, who's being crucified. Palm branches 
shouts of victory, scattering of their cloaks and tunics, kind of like a welcome mat, a red carpet of sorts for Jesus to parade into Jerusalem. Just a few short days, I mean hours, that triumphal entry into Jerusalem becomes a parade out of the city to where Jesus is mocked. They shake their heads at him. They don't shout songs of victory. And in verse 8, the psalmist says that those who surrounded him sarcastically tell him, well, trust in God. Can he deliver you? Matthew 27 tells us that the chief priests and the scribes and the um, elders mock Jesus. You save others, can't you save yourself? Verse 43 of Matthew 27, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him for, he said, I am the son of God. Jesus is personally acquainted with David's lament. The religious elites quote almost verbatim the words of Psalm 22. They would have known the psalm. You wonder, did they realize what they were doing? Now Jesus, here he is hanging on the cross, and like the psalmist describes in verse 14, he's poured out like water, bones out of joint, his heart melting like wax. In other words, my strength has dried up. My body is almost dead. And just like in verse 15, his tongue cleaves to his jaws. He's thirsty. Remember, John captures that in his gospel that Jesus says from the cross, I thirst. And then verse 16 describes this form of torture that Jesus is experiencing. They put nails in my hands and in my feet. That is clear imagery of the crucifixion. Generations before That was even a form of capital punishment. And this whole time, Jesus has been shamed because he's stripped naked hanging on the cross. The only thing it appears he owns is piled next to him, this pile of clothing. And what did the soldiers do with it? The same thing that Psalm 22, 18 uh, prophesies. They divide my garments among them. In fact, John 19 says the soldiers put it in four different piles. So four soldiers, but there was still that one tunic, that one... A thing they didn't really want to divide. So John 19, verse 24 says, So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. John tells us emphatically here that this seemingly unimportant detail happening there on Golgotha was actually fulfillment of prophecy that we find in Psalm 22. Evidently, David's life was threatened, but we find in the gospel that Jesus actually tasted of death at the hands of his enemies. He experienced the physical pain of crucifixion, the emotional pain of being rejected um, by his friends or by people, and the spiritual pain of being forsaken by God. This morning, we focus on the cross to prepare us for the celebration of his resurrection next Sunday. But we can't leave Jesus here dead on the cross, thinking that the Father did not hear the cries of the anointed one. Psalm 22 captures David's lament and Christ's lament, but it concludes as a psalm of victory. Look at the end of verse 21 that I left off there. The last phrase says, from the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. He heard. God heard the cries of his anointed one, and he answered So I want us to conclude now by looking at our salvation in the last 10 verses of this psalm. The psalmist says in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the assembly, I will praise you. So the psalm goes from lament to praise because guess what? God did not hide from his anointed one. He revealed himself. When the psalmist cried, the Lord heard that cry. When Jesus cried, the father heard the son's cry. And when you cry out to God, the Lord hears your cries as well. So like the psalmist, we praise the Lord because God does hear the cries of those who trust in him. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of of him. But more than just praise in the assembly, the psalmist declares that God will receive praise among the nations, all around the world. Verse 27 of the psalm, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will worship before you. I mean, that's a poetic declaration, but more than that, that's prophecy 
that's fulfilled. Remember, Jesus is crucified. He's buried. He's resurrected. Before he leaves, he says to his followers, now you go into the, all the world and you tell them. Well, that's fulfillment. That's victory. That's salvation for the nations. And more than just praise in the assembly and more than just praise around the world, the Father will receive glory among the generations to come. Listen to the conclusion of the psalm, verse 30, uh, 30 and 31. Posterity will serve him. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has performed it. Psalm 22 is not just lament. It's a call to God's people to praise the Lord because he delivered Jesus from death. Now, there's one last allusion here in Psalm 22 of the crucifixion of Christ. We find it in that very last phrase. It says, of Christ, uh, believers will tell of Christ's righteousness. And the last phrase of the psalm says, he has performed it. Or, it is done. That sounds a whole lot like what Jesus said from the cross. John 19, verse 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. On the day of Christ's crucifixion, it feels like all the hope has left the atmosphere. The Lord's anointed one's been crucified. The author of life has lost his life. The lament of, verse, of Psalm uh, 22 is the cry of every follower of Jesus on that day gathered at the base of Golgotha. They saw him bow his head in death. I'm sure some were holding out hope. Maybe the angels will come. Maybe they will deliver him. But it appeared from every angle that God had forsaken his son, which means he's forsaken you and me. As the crucified Jesus gives up his spirit, the earth begins to quake. The sky becomes black as night. Lightning flashes across the sky. The air turns cold. Blood runs down his head, across his beard, drops to his shoulders, down his body to his feet where it drips on the ground. And we recall the words from Moses in Leviticus 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus endured suffering on the cross. He suffered, he bled, he died so that you and I might enjoy his righteousness and his eternal kingdom with God. Verse 24 of the Psalm, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to help, to him for help, he heard. At the cross, Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the God who would rescue David from certain death would also rescue Jesus from certain death. And he'll rescue you too. Today we are grateful for Christ's death and his resurrection because it gives us the hope, both in life and hope in death. Have you believed Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? Will you believe him today? Heavenly Father, we thank you that today as we consider the cross, we don't have to shake our heads and weep over the loss of hope, we can celebrate because we know that Jesus is alive. And at the cross, he paid for our sins. At the cross, he gives us the hope of eternal life. We thank you for the cross of Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We come to, come to a time of response. Our choir's gonna sing. Perhaps you just need to pray to the Lord. You might have a decision to make. If so, I'll be down front. So let me invite you to stand as our choir sings. You respond. As the Lord is speaking to you, let me encourage you to go to your phone and call the number on your screen. And we have some folks there who would love to pray and talk with you right now. So simply call the number on your screen. We would love to hear from you. And once again, thank you so much for worshiping with us today.
know, at the cross, there is either forgiveness or there's condemnation. Because if I reject the cross, then I reject God and he'll reject me. So today, if the Lord's working in your heart, perhaps you need to square things away with him to ensure that, yes, you've placed belief in him. Perhaps you want to follow in obedience in some form or fashion. Well, don't miss the opportunity today. So service concludes while staff and volunteers at the connection desk. They'd love to pray with you. They'd love to encourage you from God's word. Don't miss this opportunity today. Now, this uh, coming week, of course, is Holy Week. And so on Thursday, um, our church commemorates Maundy Thursday, that last supper um, that Jesus had with his disciples. And so we will share at the Lord's table here at, uh, in the sanctuary at 630 in the evening. Um, I encourage you to be here. It's a wonderful service, but I think it's also just an appropriate way for the people of God to prepare themselves for remembering Good Friday, the death of Christ, but also Easter morning, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So I hope you'll join us here at 630 here at First Baptist Church. Now, of course, on Easter Sunday, we've been encouraging you, and I, I just want to urge you to do this. Just the message of the cross is not something for us to hold on to. The message of the resurrection is not just something we, we're to celebrate. From the very, just immediately following Christ's resurrection, his call to those who would follow him is to go and tell, go and make disciples to the ends of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, everywhere. And so don't miss this opportunity. You be praying and you take advantage of opportunities this week to um, share the good news, to invite somebody to church with you on Easter Sunday. You make sure they get an invitation from you. Uh, you make sure they hear the gospel. And I would, I would say this as well. Over the next two weeks, leading up to the Easter and the week coming off of Easter, as the people of God, let's pray for our lost neighbors People all across our state who don't know the gospel of Jesus Christ, who aren't in a church, who don't have friends that can share with them the good news of Jesus, let's pray that God would move in our state, move in our hearts, move in our church and our community. So you join us in doing that. Now I want to invite you to stand and I'm going to offer our benediction and then we will sing as a response to the good news of the cross. May we remember the cross and the pain of your suffering, Lord as we celebrate the salvation we have and carry your name to the nations. Thank you for joining us for worship today. For more information and to join us in the reading through the Bible this year, please visit consumed.life. We look forward to seeing you next week.